Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy takes a drive through some automotive history from the 1970s. First, he'll tell the story of the Dale, the first space-age car with a laundry list of amazing features that turned out too good to be true. Then he'll talk about the Chevy Vega, launched in 1971 to rave reviews that, rather suddenly, turned sour. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Americans do love their automobiles. We have more motor vehicles in the United States than any other country on Earth, and nearly twice as many cars per thousand residents as the average in Europe. And one example of the American obsession with automobiles is the unique designs that American automobile makers have come up with, like the famed Tucker Cyclops or the Goldwing DeLorean that was made famous in the Back to the Future movies. But one of the most interesting of the American car designs that you probably never heard of was truly a product of its era. In the story of the world, world's first space-age automobile is little known, but well worth remembering. One of the most enduring conflicts in modern history is the so-called Arab-Israeli conflict, resulting from conflicting claims over land. The conflict sparked numerous wars since the mid-20th century, starting with the Arab-Israeli War in 1948. The 1973 iteration of the decades-long conflict began on October 6th, when a coalition of Arab nations launched a joint surprise attack on Israeli-occupied territories on the day of Yom Kippur, the holiest day in Judaism. The goal of the coalition was largely to regain territory lost in another conflict in 1967. The Nixon administration was, at first, reticent to aid Israel in the conflict, owing largely to the fact that U.S. intelligence estimates indicated that Israel would likely gain the upper hand without help, and the U.S. did not want to spark an economic retaliation by Arab oil producers. But the administration changed its mind and started providing material supply to Israel on October 14th. There are multiple reasons that the U.S. decided to provide aid to Israel. First, the Egyptian attack had had much more success than American intelligence had estimated that it would. Israel had taken significant material losses, and the U.S. had a legitimate concern that their ally needed assistance or they could be annihilated. Moreover, Israel had nuclear weapons and had provided the U.S. with not-so-subtle hints that the conflict could go nuclear if the U.S. did not help to turn the tide of the war. Third, the U.S. Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, felt that providing aid would enhance the U.S. ability to impact Israeli post-war policy. And finally, U.S. officials were concerned by the fact that Egypt was receiving aid from the Soviets and were frustrated that Egypt had rejected an early ceasefire in the conflict. While much of the U.S. aid arrived after a U.N. brokered ceasefire in October, the U.S. assistance allowed Israel to use their existing forces more freely. But one immediate effect of the American support for Israel was the effect that Americans feared most. On October 16th, the day after American aid started arriving in Israel, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries started using what was called the oil weapon. Initially, they just raised prices and cut production, but eventually they enforced an embargo on all exports of oil to countries that were seen as supporting Israel, including the United States. The Arab oil embargo had wide-reaching ramifications across the globe, transforming economies and industries, shifting balances of power, and eventually contributing to a number of world conflicts and crises, and a cycle of recession and inflation. But the immediate impact to the U.S. was much higher prices for gasoline, and even gas shortages. The price per barrel of oil quadrupled in just a year, from $3 in 1973 to $12 in 1974. Prices at the pump went from a national average of 38.5 cents a gallon in May of 1973 to 55.1 cents in June of 1974. There are several reasons for the extreme impact, called an oil shock. Oil prices had actually lagged behind inflation for nearly a decade. America had become less aggressive in developing oil resources at home, and there had been no pressure for, for conservation. 
the size of popular motor vehicles had increased and there was simply no market for smaller fuel efficient cars. The average miles per gallon for an American made automobile at the time was just 15. As demand is in the short run inelastic as people still need to drive and it takes time to develop new sources and technologies, the price rise came quickly as only significant changes could match demand to supply. Still, even as prices skyrocketed, demand outstripped supply. By February of 1974, the American Automobile Association was reporting that one in five U.S. gas stations had no fuel to sell. And one immediate impact of the Arab oil embargo was that Americans were suddenly demanding smaller, more fuel efficient cars. And that's where a little known engineer who worked for a Southern California defense contractor named Dale Clift comes in. Clift was upset about the price of gas, and so he built a car in his garage by building a frame out of welded electrical conduit and covering it in naga hide. It had two seats, two wheels in the front, and in the back was the motor and just one wheel, essentially a motorcycle that had had the front end cut off. Clift was able to get his design licensed. It was lacking important safety features that were necessary to license a car, like, say, bumpers and seat belts, and so he licensed it as a motorcycle, and he drove it around town. And it might have ended there, just a novelty, except that Clift's design caught the eye of an enterprising entrepreneur. Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael was a widowed mother of five. Her husband had been a NASA engineer, and she had degrees in marketing and engineering. Having grown up on a farm in Indiana, she had been working on automobiles her entire life. She had a passion for car designs, and in Cliff's car, she saw an opportunity to turn the Detroit auto industry on its ear. She offered to develop and manufacture a car based on Cliff's design, promising him millions of dollars in royalties once the car started selling. Carmichael incorporated the 20th Century Motor Car Corporation. She started raising money from investors, opened a headquarters in Encino, and leased warehouse space in Burbank to start a factory. She decided to name the car after its designer, Dale Clift, calling the new car the Dale. The Dale was billed as the world's first space-age vehicle. The three-wheel design would reduce the weight, as would the construction, with a body made of strong but lightweight rocket structural resin. The two-seat car would only weigh a 1,000 pounds, allowing the two-stroke BMW motorcycle engine in the back to push it up to 85 miles per hour and get an astounding 70 miles to the gallon. The low center of gravity at the center of the triangle made it virtually impossible to roll over, despite the three-wheel design. And the resin was stronger than steel, and as it was molded in color, would not show scratches. Designed for efficiency, it was to operate without wires, with dashboard instruments like the speedometer and the radio plugging directly into a circuit board. All this would come at a very low price, with the two-seater retailing at just $2,000. Dollar for dollar, Carmichael boasted, the Dale was the best car ever built. The design won rave reviews from the media. Carmichael was profiled in People magazine. One Memphis newspaper raved in November of 1974 that it just may be the car of the century. A prototype was shown at the 1975 Los Angeles Auto Show, and the car was featured as a showcase prize on the game show The Price is Right. Plans for a four-seat coupe and a station wagon were also unveiled. Having raised nearly $30 million in investment, Carmichael hoped to start producing cars as early as June of 1975 but there were already storm clouds on the horizon for the company. In September of 1974, the California Corporations Commission had issued a cease and desist order preventing the sale of any new stock, noting the company did not have a license to manufacture cars, nor to license dealerships. A team from Car and Driver magazine came out to inspect the prototype and found out that it didn't even qualify as a prototype. The accelerator pedal hadn't been hooked up. In the engine compartment, someone had haphazardly shoved in a lawnmower engine. An inspection of the Burbank warehouses found that the warehouses were empty and the lease had expired. As the government started seizing assets, two senior employees of the company got into an argument at headquarters and one shot the other one dead. Turns out that they were both ex-convicts who knew each other because they had served together in San Quentin prison. Carmichael, knowing that the game was up, moved her headquarters to Texas. But when the Los Angeles DA filed charges, police found that she had abandoned her house in Dallas. Then came perhaps the biggest surprise of all. Items in the house suggested that Liz Carmichael was not a woman at all. Finally apprehended in Florida, Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael was found out to be Jerry Michael, a counterfeiter and con artist who had been on the run since 1961. Jerry Michael 
claimed to be transgender and continued to wear a dress while she represented herself in trial. During the trial, she claimed that the company was the victim of a frame job by the big automobile companies, but the defense didn't fly. She and several employees were convicted of fraud. But while the case was on appeal, she skipped bail and disappeared for nine years. She wasn't found until 1989 after the case was featured on an episode of the crime drama Unsolved Mysteries. Ironically, she had been hiding out in a small town in Texas that was named Dale. Despite the fraud that was involved in the first space age automobile, the company did employ real engineers and some of those claim to this day that the car could have been viable. The two prototypes that were created are both on display today in automobile museums in California. The designer, Dale Clift, was never found to have any connection with the fraud and only reportedly received $1,001 of the millions that he had been promised. He continued tinkering throughout his life and was awarded a couple of patents for things that he invented. He passed away in 1981. The Yom Kippur War affected the world in many ways, but it did create a mutual respect between the militaries of Egypt and Israel, and that played a central role in the 1978 Camp David Accords, the first peace treaty between an Arab nation and Israel. In the end, the scariest part of the story of the Dale, the world's first space age automobile, is how because of the oil embargo, Americans and the press were so willing to buy claims that in retrospect were outlandish. But cars have gotten more efficient and today you can retail buy automobiles that average more than 50 miles to the gallon. And so the 70 miles to a gallon car that the Dale claimed to be will come. It's just a matter of time. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. When I looked back at this story so that we could talk about it on the podcast, one of the things that struck me, again, as it had the first time, was just how many times this story takes a completely wild turn. Every time you think you have reached the last twist, it comes again. And so I wanted to ask, do you recall how you heard about this story? Yeah, I, I saw an article in uh, an online magazine called Jalopnik, which talks about cars. Uh, and I, th I think I might have even been kind of searching for like weird cars or something like that. And that's where I saw it. It is just such a bizarre story, though. It starts taking twists and turns. So I think it's just one of those things I stumbled online and said, you know, that would be a good episode. I've done that more than once on some of those uh, Today I Found Outs or This Day in History. Uh, you never you never know what you're going to find. And we've I've looked at a lot of the same ones. But man, every once in a while I come up with something that's just truly unique. That's just crazy. Yeah. And sometimes when you see them there, you, know, you pop up, and they, especially they might pop up in various yeah. social media places this way. There's much more story than that shows. Uh, and sometimes they go with the more, you know, the more popularized story that when you dig into it might not be quite the full story. So it's really fun to go dig into those a little bit more in the way that we're. Yeah, I've seen that happen more than once where they'll, they'll, you know, list it with some kind of a clickbait like title. And then when you actually go look into it, you're like, oh, okay, maybe that was not entirely a fair, yeah. or that's only like one version of the story. And this one, this one is just a, just a monster of a tale. I have to say the Dale car still looks space age. If someone came out with that today, and we do have three wheeled vehicles today, although nothing quite like the Dale, I, I just, I still think I would be like, oh yes, this, this looks like the future. There's, uh, I mean, there's uh, various kinds of those that are that are out today. It's, it's got to be kind of popular to have a vehicle that's got two wheels in the front and one wheel in the back. They don't quite look like though they're trying to be a car, a three wheel. Which the Dale was really trying to look like a car that was a three wheel car. It, I mean, the idea, that part of the idea is not crazy that you could save, you know, some significant amount of energy and use a smaller motor and 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 have essentially something that's kind of in between a motorcycle and a car. And we are seeing both of those on the road today. I mean, it's going to be a more common thing. So, I mean, it's uh, how far ahead of its time was they actually had three-wheel cars on the same idea of two in the front, one in the back in Europe for, I mean, since the 20s. So it wasn't a, a brand new idea. But uh, it was an interesting and novel concept at the time of the fuel shortage uh, that seemed like that was time to really kind of talk yeah. about that. And, I mean, that's the dude who built his own little car, uh, Dale, Dale Clift. He was an mm -hmm. interesting dude, and it really does sound like he just, you know, he just wanted to build something he was sick of the gas prices which i think uh, even people today will understand we might not be at 1970s gas crisis level but <laughs> uh, those prices are yeah climbing well, up. So they might get there yeah but that, we haven't seen the lines quite yet but uh, uh he was a tinkerer and he wanted to be a tinker. and it's kind of interesting that uh, he couldn't you couldn't have, have licensed that as a car and so he just said well just call it a motorcycle and then it doesn't have to have bumpers or seat belts or you know anything uh and uh, and he was able to license that thing he drove it around but so the original version of that car though was literally pvc pipe yeah. 
uh, that, that was covered with Naga hide. So, I mean, it was, yeah, he it was not, wasn't something it was that, not really, a yeah, car. that was never going to be a production vehicle. No. Yeah. Yeah. It was not really a car. Yes. It was, it was essentially a three wheel motorcycle with a yeah. tarp. I still see it. occasionally some stuff. We we're a little rural out here and I'll see some people with some trucks that they have, uh, uh, done things to that. I'm sure they can license them as, uh, as cars. They're not quite as crazy as, uh, that one but i'll tell you some people do enjoy tinkering and they want to just kind of make an odd and unique looking thing yeah and he it sounds like he just liked to like drive it around the neighborhood but the 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 question though is when liz carmichael saw that was liz carmichael thinking this is a revolutionary idea and the perfect time to sell that revolutionary idea or was it always a scam I mean, from the very start, was it a scam? And that was just used to try to give some legitimacy to the yeah. scam. We really, we don't know. We never quite figured out because certainly to the end, she insisted that she planned to build this car, that this was going to be a real car, that she had been attacked and destroyed by the, the auto industry. And it might be someone who had a vision and just, you know, could not put, I mean, the, the financing and everything to try to start up an automobile company maybe just was just too much. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, she was... Uh, she was hiring criminals <laughs> from from straight out of jail. I mean, one of them shot the other. Yeah, she was she was a known uh, con artist. She was a known matter of fact. She was she had become a she uh, apparently to. I mean, it's, that's we also don't know for sure if she was truly trans or if that was all just a, a scam to hide from the previous charge. Uh, but I mean, she insisted that 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 she was a girl. So we'll use we'll use the the pronoun she. But uh, it, we we really we honestly don't know how much of that was all scam and how much from the start yeah. was. Um, we know there were certainly times when she was bilking investors uh, on on a borrowed space that had nothing going on in there. Uh, but I mean, was that because you know? they were really trying to build a company and they were trying to keep up a brave face to keep the investment going or was this always just a, a scheme from the start you know who knows i mean i honestly don't know one of the you know one of the questions i i have about it is that i mean they had so many claims so many claims mm -hmm. they had all these claims about you know it was some kind of cool new uh, aluminum that was you know would never show scratches yeah. space age aluminum and it was supposed to be dyed throughout yeah. the color was throughout so the scratch wouldn't show I, I mean, how did anybody buy that i mean who who no and but when they finally got someone in to go and test it, and they looked in there there was like a lawnmower yeah, motor it was it was clearly something. and was that because they they did believe they could do it and they just you know didn't have the the money to actually do it or is that because they were building a thing and shoving a lawnmower motor. I don't know. I mean, some of that very positive press was the sort of stuff that you get kind of in the newspaper. Yeah. And it's, it was, it's when they got actual automotive press so that it was real experts uh, that they started realizing that they were really stonewalling about seeing the actual technology. Okay. And it was when someone from Car and Driver went in there that they went like, this, this is not a car and you can't drive it. It doesn't have a steering wheel. So it's, this is not a car. And it's not a, so, so it might be, you know, that, you know, there are people that are excited to get good news. That's kind of how media works sometimes. Uh, uh, and uh, and so you know, uh, and she was apparently very charismatic and could, could give this convincing storyline. Yeah. Uh, and and so it's uh, so that good press from the start. It might have been simply that uh, she was deliberately targeting people who did not have the expertise to. That's question part. Her. That was one of because my because it certainly seems yeah. that it would be obvious. Was it, was she just uh, were people just desperate for something to shake up the market like that, or was she a good saleswoman? Yeah. And you know how how that or how did it work. Connect. But I mean, she seemed to have hired real automotive uh, engineers, and some of them insisted that this was a viable automobile, that they were really working on something real. So I mean, was she bilking them too, or was she just using them as cover to get the raise the investment? I mean, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's and you know, it's t today we call that the Tiger King. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really just kind of hard to figure yeah, out here <laughs> exactly it, it, who was being yeah. honest and who was who was like you know being sincere. Yeah, I mean, at, at the point that your business uh, and that happened with DeLorean yeah. too. But I mean, at the point that your business starts collapsing, you do all sorts of desperate things to try to keep that vision going because it's your whole life uh, and I, I honestly don't know I don't know if Liz Carmichael had a vision and was desperately trying to protect that vision and that's where all of the scams started coming apart or if Liz Carmichael who had you know already been convicted as a con artist essentially uh, and, and and you know put on a dress to avoid that charge if Liz Car Carmichael from the start said I can build this for lots of money and I'd never plan on building a car I don't know I think I mean maybe I don't we'll, know. maybe we'll never know but one of the things that I think one of the unanswered questions whether this is Liz Carmichael or uh, Jerry Michael, is what, what, I have a hard time understanding her motives. What, what is it that she wanted out of it? And I will say, when you think about it coming from a, uh, from a con standpoint, uh, she did run away and got a, she was away for a while before they caught her. But I, yes. I'm not sure. It Ironically, in Dale, Texas, that's where she went and hid. That's right? The... I, that, which it, I, I don't know. That means it maybe is a little too on the nose. But I, I just, I'm not sure what, it doesn't seem like she, you know, 
grabbed a suitcase of dollar of you know unmarked dollar bills and ran away with it it seems like she got into hot water and then didn't want to go to jail yeah, maybe got a, but, yeah, but that's true i mean she, she might have just been jiving on the press yeah. and, and looking like an important person and i you know, honestly don't know uh, and of course and she's yeah. gone now she's been gone for for you know what 18 years so i, I will probably never get a full answer on that question but i mean it's certainly an interesting personality personality i don't know who else could have could have done the whole thing uh, it is kind of bizarre, even when you look at the photographs, that that no one seemed to question, uh, uh, you know, whether you know whether she was uh, was trans or was an actual. I mean, everybody. I mean, she had kids. Everybody believed that she was she was just a woman, uh, and so that they were shocked when they found well, out. Well, she she stayed and with her you, family you, for a you, while, and she would introduce her wife as a uh, as a secretary. As the secretary, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it's all a very strange story. But I mean, it's, it's, it's weird that there's parts of it no one ever questioned. Yeah. No one ever questioned why she was hiring executives that had, you know, with their prison records. Uh, and, and, and so as it's when it all fell apart, it's like, wow, this was truly a house of cards. Yeah. I mean, nothing here, it's not just that nothing here was as it seemed, but I mean, that's that pretty obvious. I mean, you didn't have to, the paint was actually scratched relatively easily if you were careful. So I wonder, because they like gave a Dale away uh, on, in a showcase on The Price is Right. And I wonder whatever happened yeah, to that wonder. person that supposed they wanted Dale, uh, and uh, they never actually uh, received a car. Yeah, they never got to, you know the people actually get the stuff out of the showcase, and just, you know they get an IOU, and the car's never built. But I mean, how did you even go display whatever they had produced in a way that someone didn't figure out that this is this is not well? A there car. was this is apparently it. of like the three prototypes they made, uh, there was only one of them that even drove on its own power. Well, say a car and driver went didn't have a steering yeah. wheel and it was a, a lawnmower motor in it. I mean, there was it was not even an attempt to make it. A and real so car. they they talk about you know they were like oh it could go eighty miles an hour or anything like that. It seems like they were making those claims without having ever actually tested any or miles or, per or, gallon yeah, the, or the or miles whatever. per yeah. gallon that it was so, getting. So I mean I think you know I I mean they had actual engineers. I think they probably had ideas. I think they were really excited about their ideas. But I mean obviously when Liz Carmichael said I drove this into a wall at thirty miles an hour and saw no damage, that was just a yeah. lie, straight up lie. It never happened. Uh, and and there's no way that you know that even could drive. how did. Yeah, I mean, you, couldn't, you couldn't even gotten that car to 30 miles. And how would you hit the wall? Because you don't have a steering wheel. <laughs> so, I mean, so I, so, I mean, she was clearly, you know, willing to lie. And there got, had to have been plenty of people in the company that knew that there's no way that that was true. I mean, it had to have been all of those engineers, even the ones who say, I think this could have been a viable car. They had to know that that model that they had couldn't hit a wall at 30 yeah. miles per hour and be fine. And some of it, like a solid state dashboard, doesn't yeah, even, even. I mean, even today, that doesn't doesn't make sense that you wouldn't have moving parts in your dashboard because that's that's not how dashboards yeah, work. Yeah, it's interesting how they were how they were claiming, and I mean, it does seem like once the experts started to look at it, and that's one of the things that makes you wonder if it was if it was earnest or completely fraud. Because I mean, she was hiring criminals, but on the other hand, she apparently had engineers, and you know, why do you have real engineers if you don't? That seemed. That seemed and they seem to be at least as built as anybody else yeah. was uh, the, the, to find out that it wasn't. Well, certainly real. Cliff and, was. And you do have to wonder, if, if, if you truly tried to make an automobile using all of the space age technology that we have, I mean, you might come up with a Tesla. I don't know. But I mean, I mean could, what, what could we have done at the time if we were truly you know, doing everything we could with all that we'd learned from the space? I think people were totally willing to believe that we had discovered all sorts of new technologies and that we would bring those technologies like Tang, we would bring <laughs> them to the public and you really could make a car that could do things that you couldn't believe. And the public was willing to hear that, especially at a time when they, what they really wanted to hear was that they you know, wouldn't have to sit in a gas yeah. line because it was going to go 80 miles on a gallon and you know if you think about it now we have hybrids and electrics and also i mean cars cars today are, are very different yeah. uh, and they are able to be safer with less weight and, and i mean a lot of the things that they talked about we were able to get to so how much could we have done at the time and it's it's really i mean there's there's a couple of fascinating discussions one is how did this story ever fly yeah. how did you how did you have i mean these the news reports were very sincerely i mean incredibly glowing reports about how much this is going to change the world i'm like how did you so befuddle you know any serious person, but they really did, uh, and and you know was it always a scam? Was it, that's one of the questions. But the other question is, what if they had really you know tried to do what they were talking about doing, and, and you know what would that have been like? Something that's curious about it is that because they're you know, given the engineers who thought there was something in it, given some of the kind of basic ideas that would suggest you know like this three wheeled car might not be the worst idea. It's interesting to me that we we don't seem to have seen any of the car companies actually create something like that or make any real serious attempt to design one and maybe that maybe that's because they looked into it and it isn't as viable as yeah, I mean, it was never going to yeah. work and i mean but you know she's going to argue that those those companies are used to doing what they do and they fight anybody who wants to do anything different than what so, they so do. Fair point. I mean there have been rumors 
there have been rumors for decades that GM had a car that drives on water, and so they hit it because no one wants to, you know, because they 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 are they're in bed with the fuel companies or what. I mean, that's stuff. So I mean, uh, you can see how people might yeah. believe it, and you can see also how a, a standard automobile company might have the sort of you know, institutional impetus not even to consider something like that. Uh, and I, I mean, I guess that all seems maybe theoretically possible, but you're right. I mean, if all of that was really going to make such a change, well, then, you know, they would have put that into the Vega. And, you know, that's that's the other part. And, and they kind of tried and they found out that, yeah, you the, know. The, the Vega is kind of a lesson not quite in, so easy. in the other direction of this. What The Dale never really got tested, but... <laughs> Yeah, but I mean the big, it's the same sort of story where they're trying to say let's take all this all these new ideas and rethink the whole automobile and come up with something special and you find out that uh, that you know maybe maybe physics and <laughs> metallurgy and all the science that goes in the construction of a car you know only limits as far as you can go in terms of, of being that yeah. radical. But I mean you, what would you what would they have thought at the time about a hybrid automobile more or less an all electric automobile or I mean, I mean we have things today that I think you know, would have been a surprise. Well, there. and hopefully we still will 20 years from now. We'll have, they're talking about trying to have hydrogen powered cars and Who stuff. Knows? And I don't know what that'll look like. Um, I, I, you know, I wish I, I'm, I'm a historian. I, I can't predict the future. I, I do kind of wonder, because uh, your sister is 15, uh, and I wonder if most of her life she won't have to drive a car. That she's going to be, I think we're very much on the verge of self driving cars. It's an interesting I, I question, too. If she's really going to be, you know, driving cars most of her life or for the most life, uh, part, cars are going to be driving hers. Her. Because I, I think she's on the cusp Gosh, of that. That'd be such a different relationship to have with a car than the ones that we have had for, uh, I mean, the whole American idea of what kind of relationship you have with a car. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, I mean, I, my first car only had a lap belt. Didn't have the three-point system yet. Uh, my first car was standard. I still know how to drive a clutch there. But, I mean, I, I don't buy them anymore. You can't hardly find them Hard to find, anymore. yeah. So, I mean, it's I, the, certainly automobiles have changed an awful lot in my lifetime. But, I mean, it's, you know, the the style of the cars when you are impressionable it always sticks with That's you. True. And, you know, then when you see modern cars, you're like, oh, it looks like a moving shoebox or whatever. And, and so I, and so we have such a relationship with cars in America because the, the distances involved and things like that. And, and, and uh, it, it, it means that it becomes part of culture, and then changing that is a change in culture, and it changes not just the aesthetic, but the entire idea of, you know, what is a proper life, and you know that that might be why your grandparents drive the big old Cadillac with fins, and you know we would look at that, you know, they to them that was the height of opulence, and and you know another generation might look at it and say that's you know that's ridiculous, it's a boat, uh, and so I, it's cars are all interesting. You can certainly see at the time. While people would believe the idea that we would take all of the ideas of the space race, that we build a car, and that that would come from a an entrepreneur who was fighting, you know, big automobile, uh, and at the same time be telling you that you're going to have a car that's going to get you out of the gas crisis, you can see why people were eager to believe yeah. that. And you, but I mean, again, that you know that leads us to the same question that we just don't know. I mean, was she a business person who saw that opportunity or was she a con artist who saw that oppor that you know people were in a particularly gullible and I, I ultimately it's yeah. difficult to know even with the information we have uh, and i don't know that we'll get any more so well, i mean uh, she's yeah. dead now uh, but but i mean that's this 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 episode's what probably 12 minutes and i think there was a, an hbo series that was several episodes long that, a, a document a longer documentary so i mean there's there's probably some more answers to talk about with it but what it really is is it's just a it's a crazy story about what someone can get away with and a story with so many twists and turns that leaves off with just questions. One of the questions being, could they have actually done this? They tried. I don't know. It's a great story. I mean, I, I love stories of history. And uh, this story, I mean, you, you, if you made up a plot line for a movie, people would say like, yeah, I don't believe that. <laughs> Every time you turn, you're, it's, it's something so completely out of left field. When, when it comes yeah. in that, that she was, you know, that she was trans that, <laughs> and that she was originally born as Jerry Michael, yeah. that is... Yeah, they're busting into the house in Dallas, you know, hoping to find crates of suitcases of cash. And what they find are, uh, you know, uh, uh, prosthetics that are clearly made to, I mean, that, that had to be just totally so unsuspecting because that's not at all what they expected. Yeah, to find, it's, yeah. but I mean, also when you find it, when they go to the factory and find out that it's, there's nothing inside the factory. They don't even have the yeah. lease on it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, because at the, because there's a point where they're like they're selling stock and they don't have a plan, and we got to stop them selling stock. But then to go find out that it, and it was all everything yeah. was just you know movie set front. I mean, there was nothing behind the scenes that had to be stunning, uh, because there was so much enthusiasm about it. It's a, it's a great story, and I, 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 one part of me thinks I wish that they could. I uh, it would have been great if the Dale had been a real car. You know, it, in some ways, it would have been a better story if that if that had been the story, and now Dale had buried the big three, and we were all driving around in three wheel cars. I, I think about the 
the fact died. that that uh, if if they actually had had a car behind it, how different that could look today, instead yeah. of this looking like just a complete absurdity. Yeah, well, I mean, when they brought her up on charges yeah. and like, you know, this is all fake. If she'd like, no, here, drive it, you know, then that, I mean, that would have been an incredible story yeah. too. But I mean, it is, it is just, it's absurd. And it is a crazy story of twists and turns and absolutely, it would be a great movie uh, and uh, should be at some point, it really should. Uh, and and it's certainly a great story. And it's it's an interesting bit of history. And it, it's more than just the, you know, the scam of the car that was never built. I mean, it's it's really uh, how the public sees things and what they're willing to accept and why they're willing to accept it is really an absolutely story that very much tells about the, the psyche of the American public at the time. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one of those reasons I love being the history guy. It was a great story to tell. It was a great story to research. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? As always, I've, I've, we've been looking at a lot of stuff on Magellan TV. Of course, we may, we talk about Magellan TV on the YouTube channel as well, so that's always got us watching documentaries. Uh, the one that I watched today that I thought was really fun was one about uh, the painter Bob Ross. It's called The Happy Painter. So There's a couple of Bob Ross documentaries out right now. One of them kind of talks about the fight over his business empire after he died, but this one really just talks about him as a person and how he got to be who he was. And I have to say, it was just it was just delightful. I was really surprised. So uh, And he's just an interesting personality, and so I saw that and said, huh, you know, I'd like to see more. It's funny because uh, you always assume when they make a documentary that there's some hidden dark side, you know, that he appears to have been, you know, we don't make mistakes, we have happy little accidents. And that's, that seems to be what his entire life was. Wow. Uh, one of the biggest surprises to me is that the hair was not deliberate. Huh. Uh, his, his hair was straight. Early on, he was trying to make a lot out of a $1,000 investment to turn that into a business. And he figured out that if he permed his hair, he wouldn't have to keep getting it cut. <laughs> and then when the business grew, it had become such a signature item that he couldn't go back. That's a, that's a hysterical story. And it's 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 a little bit like the story of how the history I ended up wearing bow ties because I mean it wasn't I, mean, I didn't intend to always wear a bow tie and once you start wearing it and everybody recognizes you by it then you, gosh you can't go outside without a bow tie. <laughs> it was a delightful documentary uh, that it has a lot of interviews from people who knew him quite well as well, well as a number of uh, you know fairly famous stars who were impacted by him. I mean I and I'm not I can't say I'm a super fan I haven't watched every show uh, I can say I must be a good fan because I, I very proudly say that I have a Bob Ross action figure. <laughs> He just seems like such a happy guy, and you just watch the show and you feel happy afterwards, even though I, I, mean, I was never going to pick up a paintbrush and make a picture out of it, because he truly believed that everybody could paint. And he said, I mean, I'm not making art for galleries, I'm making art for people to enjoy doing art and to convince anybody that they can do art. And he had a guy tell him once, he says, I can never be an artist, I'm colorblind. And so, that, so he did his next episode, he did a black, or a, a, all gray tone uh, painting, and, and he, was, he was that same guy. He thought he could change people's lives with a paintbrush. And he really did. And when you dig underneath the hood, you find out that that's really who he oh, was. Oh, that's lovely. What have you been watching on Magellan TV lately? I was watching something on the Giza pyramids. This guy, his name is Jean-Pierre, and he specifically is an architect. He's, he's actually, he wasn't a, an archaeologist, but he, his father had come up with this idea about how they built the pyramids of Egypt, which, while we have lots of ideas of how they might have done it, uh, we're still not really 100% sure. And his, his main thing is that he thought, uh, instead of them building ramps on the outside of it, used internal ramps so that they didn't actually have to support a structure on the outside of the pyramid or anything like that. And so he was trying to find evidence of this ramp. Uh, but mm -hmm. he, he ends up looking a lot into kind of how this theory works. It seems to make sense logically. And I kind of liked the idea of, a, of an architect kind of looking into this and being like, okay, so this is how I might build it. And he had some other thoughts and stuff that I'll I'll leave some of that out so that if you want to go watch it, as you watch should. The documentary. I, I, it's interesting that there's, it's still a mystery. Yeah. And I, I've, I've heard plenty of theories. Some of them, you know, more outlandish than others. I mean, this is certainly less outlandish than some of the ones that oh, come yeah. out there. <laughs> And that's why you still, and they are still re researching that mystery, yeah. and you still wonder what evidence we might find in that mystery, and that makes it good TV. Absolutely, and Magellan has good TV. Uh, that's just an honest fact. When you're watching that stuff, it's just as dramatic as anything you'll find, and they always learn something there, and it doesn't have to be about history. It doesn't. Uh, science, art, literature, true crime, lots and lots of history, though, of all sorts of kinds. I mean, the thing about Magellan is a streaming service that's actually owned by documentary filmmakers. They know what they're doing, and they have a passion for what they're doing. And that's one of the reasons that we love Magellan TV. And thank you so much, Magellan TV, for sponsoring our podcast. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy.
Next up, the history guy tells the troubled story of the Chevy Vega. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the history guy. By the 1970s, American automakers were feeling the pinch from foreign competition. Japanese and European automakers were producing small fuel-efficient cars that faced little domestic challenge in the American market. But that all changed in 1971 when the newly coined subcompact market was taken by storm by the Chevrolet Vega. It was an innovative design that won Motor Trend Magazine's Car of the Year Award. Car and Driver named it the best economy sedan three years running. The Chevy Vega transformed the American auto industry and eventually would become legend. But not for the reasons that GM might have hoped. The cautionary tale of the automobile that popular mechanics described as the car that nearly destroyed GM deserves to be remembered. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, General Motors was one of the largest companies in the world. In 1956, it was twice the size of the second largest U.S. company, Standard Oil. At the time, GM's divisions were run as essentially independent companies, totally under the control of their division heads. They controlled their engineering, marketing, production, and even dealership networks. Divisions rarely shared engines, parts, or designs, but worked on their own. The Vega was unique from the start. It was one of the first cars designed by General Motors corporate and then given to the Chevy division to build and market. The Vega was proposed by pioneering automotive engineer Ed Cole, then GM's executive vice president of operating staffs, and beat out proposals from the Chevy and Pontiac divisions. Engineer James G. Musser, who had helped to develop the popular Chevy Nova and Camaro models, was in charge of the Vega's development and said that the car was the first vehicle where one person was in charge. The car was specifically meant to utilize the new technology of die-cast aluminum engines. Starting in 1968, Chevy put Musser in charge of the car's development to fast-track its development and get it to the market in two years. There was another wrinkle in the Vega's design, though. GM wanted to sell it as cheaply as possible. They wanted a, a price point around $2,000 that would keep it competitive with the Ford Pinto and popular foreign models like the VW Beetle and the Toyota Corolla. One of the ways they kept costs low was a new kind of transportation. 18 Vegas per rail car fit on top-level auto racks. So Chevy came up with a new way of transporting the car. The Vertipack. The Vertipack transported the cars vertically, nose down, and allowed each rail car to carry 30 cars, reducing transportation costs by 40%. But Chevy also wanted to deliver the vehicles with topped-off fluids, which meant that designers had to engineer solutions to prevent liquids from leaking during transport. They created a special oil baffle, battery caps, and a special tube in the carburetor to prevent oil from leaking. The Vega retailed for $2,090 when it was first introduced, about $13,000 in $2020. In 1969, John DeLorean, yes, that John DeLorean, became the division head for Chevrolet after a four-year stint at Pontiac. It was under DeLorean that the Vega was handed to Chevy, a nearly complete car over which Chevy would have little to no design control. They were only expected to sell it. DeLorean would devote an entire chapter to the Vega in his 1979 book, On a Clear Day, You Can See General Motors, in which he said the car produced a hostile relationship between the corporate staffs and Chevrolet. From the first day I stepped into Chevrolet, the Vega was in trouble, he said. While GM had high expectations, there was practically no interest in it in the division. DeLorean said the engineers only went through the motions. This was not their car, and they did not want to work on it. The Chevrolet engineers also had troubles with the design. DeLorean described the engine as noisy and said the engineers were embarrassed of it. When they went to test the new car after just eight miles, the front end fell off. DeLorean said it must have set a new record for the shortest time taken for a new car to fall apart. Engineers added more weight to fix the problem. None of the Chevy engineers enjoyed Ed Cole coming by to check on progress and believed that he was rushing production. Cutting cost and weight everywhere they could, they cut out plastic fender liners to save just $2.88 per car. Despite these cuts, the car still came out more expensive than they wanted and was several hundred dollars more than the VW Beetle. GM lauded the car, calling it innovative, with a simple design that would introduce a new era in the auto body building. It had fewer parts than similar cars and a much touted six-stage rust-proofing process. GM chose the name Vega, as one had said, after a star of the first magnitude, brightest in the constellation Lyra. They called it the little car that did everything well. 
Even Deloria went to bat for the car, saying the Vega would be built at a quality level that has never been attained before in a manufacturing operation in this country. Its popularity was helped thanks to the oil crisis, which drove up demand for small fuel-efficient vehicles. The Vega got an excellent, for the time, MPG of 28 city and could get as high as 40 miles per gallon on the highway. When the car was released in 1970, it came in several designs, including a two-door hatchback and a two-panel delivery version. Despite troubles, including a strike at the Lordstown, Ohio plant where it was built, in its first year the car sold well. Almost 300,000 were produced for the 1971 model year, and the next two years saw sales over 400,000. The car quickly took over American roads. It was well reviewed. In addition to Motor Trend's Car of the Year, Road and Track said the Vega was, beyond a doubt, the best handling passenger car ever built in the United States. But problems weren't far behind. In April 1972, a recall affected 129,000 Vegas because engine backfires could damage the muffler, which could cause the car to overheat, which could start a fire. In May, another recall affected 350,000 Vegas because a loose part could cause the throttle to be jammed open. And in July, a recall affected 500,000 Vegas because the rear axle could become detached. One writer noted that by the end of 1972, 95% of all Vegas had critical safety flaws. Several other problems haunted Vega owners. The aluminum engine had a tendency to shake, which broke valve stems, and the engine got so hot it frequently warped. Instead of steel sleeves, the engine cylinders were coated in silica, but the heat distorted the cylinders, which caused the silica to wear off, causing the engine to guzzle oil or even fail completely. Chevy offered a number of fixes to owners at no cost, like a coolant overflow bottle and a retrofitted electronic coolant meter, but the problems stressed both Chevy's bottom line and the reputation. Vegas also quickly obtained a reputation for rusting because the six-stage process had numerous issues. When the frame was submerged for coating, Chevy failed to account for air pockets that prevented full coverage. The lack of the plastic fender liner and thin metal exacerbated the issue. One worker recalled that it was his job to touch up rust spots that occurred before the car had even left the lot. Ralph Nader, founder of the Center for Auto Safety, described the Vega as sloppily crafted, unreliable, and unsafe. Along with its design flaws, the car unfortunately faced production issues. The Lordstown, Ohio plant where it was built was billed as the most advanced and automated production facility in the nation. The Lorian instituted strict quality control and even fixed the cars as they came off the line, but in 1971, GM put the plant under the GM Assembly Division, and hundreds of workers were immediately fired, including quality control workers. Morale at the plant was notoriously low, and workers apparently were doing sloppy work or even sabotage as production attempted to reach 100 cars an hour. Problems with the workforce led to a 22-day wildcat strike in March of 1972. Lordstown Syndrome became a term that represented particularly bad labor management relations. The source of many of the Vegas problems was its rushed production. Cars Magazine said that tests which should have been done at the proving grounds were performed by customers, necessitating numerous piecemeal fixes by dealers. Chevrolet's bright star received an enduring black eye despite a continuing development program which eventually alleviated most of those initial shortcomings. But those fixes were slow in coming. It wasn't until the 1976 model that Chevy attempted to fix most of the engine issues. Jim was so confident in the new Durabilt version of the car, they had nine drivers take shifts to run Vegas nonstop for 60,000 miles, and none of them overheated. But it was too late. By 1976, it produced only 160,000 cars, and that number was less than half that for the car's final model year in 1977. Even when it was selling well, it never outsold the Ford Pinto. DeLorean tried to sell a souped-up version called the Cosworth Vega for two years, which had a twin-cam Cosworth engine, but the car was too expensive for the time. Recession and inflation made the car twice as expensive as the regular model, unattractive, and only a few thousand cars were sold. The whole model was retired in 1977, although rebadged versions like the Chevy Monza continued for a few more years. Despite its individual failures, the Vega itself was not catastrophic for GM. GM was a huge company, and it was making plenty of money to absorb what it lost on the Vega. One writer noted that checkered history only reinforced the belief that GM made inferior small cars. This legacy would prove far more important than any direct impact the Vega would have on GM profits. Vega became synonymous with bad, a reputation that stuck to GM. This was true for other American subcompacts built to compete with imports as well, such as the much-maligned Ford Pinto and the AMC Gremlin. 
It was also emblematic of the changing times. No longer would each division be controlled like a self-running fiefdom, but each would work as parts of a whole, sharing designs, parts, and even engines. The Pontiac Aster and the Chevy Monza were both based on the Vega frame. Today, many cars have twins that are altered and rebranded cars that use the same parts. All of this reduces overhead and makes it easier for consumers to repair their cars. The Vega was an attempt to produce and release an inexpensive car by taking advantage of new technology. But the new technology was insufficiently tested, and inexpensive seemed to mean cheap, providing a fertile ground for imports like the Toyota Corolla, the Beetle, the Honda Accord, and many others that are so common on today's roads. Some two million Vegas were produced in the 1970s, but they disappeared from the roads almost as quickly as they had appeared. The Vega represented significant changes not for just General Motors, but for the American auto industry as a whole as the trends that drove the Vega. More foreign competition, rapidly changing technology, and the demand for more fuel-efficient cars drove the industry for years to come. To be fair, the Vega still does have its supporters. In 2010, Motorton Classic Magazine said that well-maintained examples are great-looking, nice-driving, economical classics, like Baltic Avenue with a hotel. But actually, for the most part, the car's reputation is almost comically dismal, and they very frequently make the lists of worst cars ever built. Car and Driver Magazine described the Vega as one of the most embarrassing award winners in automotive history and said of the Vega that the only time anyone ever saw a Vega on the road when it wasn't puking out oily smoke was when it was being towed. This is, it's an interesting story because it's everything that can go wrong from an institutional perspective. You know, they were, they were centralized. They passed it off to people who weren't committed to the project. Uh, they were so busy trying to make it cheap. Uh, that uh, they ended up cutting quarters that, you know, ended up kept coming back to bite them. You have to wonder why an American car company couldn't, you know, make a Volkswagen. I mean, that's why, I mean, that's why Volkswagens are as iconic as they are. But you have to wonder why, you know, an American company couldn't possibly conceive of what it would take to make that successfully. But it's interesting because it, it truly was thought to be revolutionary. And, every, and everybody was excited to see and, and it turns out that uh, when you push too many boundaries, it turns out not being that great a car. But I can say on this episode, we get comments all the time from people who love their Vega, who had a Vega and absolutely love it. And we certainly got a lot of people who mentioned the, the, the car people who pulled out the motor and put in a bigger motor into the small car that's and able to zip along. And, yeah, that seemed to be the solution in a lot of the people who seem to like it, is they'll say they and pulled it was, out that At the time, motor. it was really cheap styling, and now that's seen as kind of classic styling. So, I mean, there's people, there they're Vega lovers. Uh, but there's an also a, a lot of people who said, I got a Vega, and I yeah. would, you know, I would put in as much oil as gas, you know. it was. Yeah, there was somebody who said that it was, it was revolutionary because it was the first car made of compressed rust. <laughs> I mean, they had this fancy system for how they were painting that car, where they were dunking the car, and it just turned out it didn't work. It got air bubbles that they didn't account for, and then the, and so you had a, a separation between the, the the frame and the or the the, the metal and the and the paint. And so this car that Incredible. was supposed to have a special system that was supposed to prevent all that, and they had guys literally on the lot whose job it was to touch up rust before it left the lot. It's just it's just incredible how how ineffective so many of their uh, I mean advances were. Oh, yeah. Well, the aluminum head, you know, that was oh, the yeah. big change. Complete disaster. And that, the whole thing was essentially started by an aluminum head, and that the warping of the aluminum head is the reason the things that the oil was always dripping out of them. They ended up, for a lot of the Vegas, that that engine would crap out, and they would literally just give them a new engine of the same kind that would probably eventually break. Yeah, it was easier. <laughs> they had they had remarkably short lifespans because they were shaking they were shaking themselves apart. They had several of those uh, as we we talked about in the episode. They had all these safety calls, and I, there's the one line where it's like 95 percent of them have a <laughs> had significant flaws, and it's it's just incredible that they they worked so hard. And it's clear that from I mean engineering from start to finish, they were trying to do this new kind mm -hmm. of engineering. It was it was you know across across the various uh, groupings. And they, they were trying because they had own. acquired a lot of companies yeah. that operated essentially as independent companies, and they were trying to see can we you know make this a more unified team. And, and you know that didn't that, that's a difficult thing to do administratively. It ended up not working out. The, yeah. the engineers were not committed to the automobile that had been handed down by GM. 
And, yeah. and that clearly yeah. made a significant difference. It's interesting. And, and it goes back to what we talked about with the Dale, too, is that the American automobile manufacturers had for decades been building towards a, a single idea of a car. And then along, you know, everything changes. And instead of a, a nicer, more solid car, uh, suddenly people need fuel efficient economy cars. And it, it was very difficult for us to restructure around the whole idea of economy cars. And uh, you know, we nobody found success. I mean, no. they're, they're all they're all cars that you, you know, gremlins and pintos and, and <laughs> yeah, none of them. None of them are like, ah, oh, yes, that is the classic, beautiful, stunning yeah. car of the, the that was that worked so well. <laughs> Instead, you know, we got the stuff. I mean, a lot of the some of the cars that we see today all over the place, the Corolla, uh, the Volkswagen, that same that same idea is that those were the the you know the iconic cars of that period. And it's interesting that the American companies just couldn't. Couldn't yeah, it was, well, it was very hard for them to make the, sh the shift. Well, I mean, we had, we did an episode on tires and we, how difficult it was for American manufacturers to move to radial tires because their entire manufacturing tube. system was built around tube tires. And so it's difficult when, you're whole in, when you have this whole institutional weight behind what you're doing. You know, that's how Liz Carmichael could say, I have a whole different idea and the reason it's not being built there is because they don't look at whole different ideas. Yeah. And what you see with the, with the Vega is they were trying to do that and, you know, it was, they just weren't good at it. I mean, it yeah. was simply not their skill. But I mean, crazy things like you know they for three dollars a car they removed the, the liner on the bumper and then the bumpers rusted out yeah. and i mean it, it, if they had had so, the liner in there it would have held it together much better it's incredible because that and they still didn't get the price they it was still uh and it was still dollars. more expensive yeah yeah it was still more expensive than its competitors one of the one of the things that that really shocked me about this was that they did some kind of incredible stuff and when you look at it you wonder if it was worth it to make the prices better they created the the those rail cars that the Verta pack mm -hmm. so that they could pack these things. But then they wanted to, you know, have the have it top to the fluids. And all I can think is all the engineering that they had to do to make sure that I mean they had to change all the fluid stuff to make it so that it could be vertical in transportation. And the thing is the only time that car was going to be vertical was when it was in transport before before it's anyone had ever so, driven it. So really does I mean does it save you enough to have an extra, you know, twelve cars on the on the I think it car. illustrates just how how tight they really were on the money on that, as they really could not. But I mean, it's just, they were truly looking for innovative ideas. Yeah. I mean, but you know, at the point where you, do you really consider is this really going to pay itself off? It's a, it's an interesting question. The thinking was all very strange. was It was all very bizarre. But I mean, they were trying to do something that was kind of outside of their wheelhouse. And you know, when you do that, often your first uh, your first try is not quite what you hoped it would. Well, be. and the and it's interesting that the you know the Vega or the pieces of the Vega ended up surviving well well past with like the the Chevy Monza and stuff like that is that they used they still used it as a basis for other uh, cars and they they updated it a little bit and none of those ones I mean I don't I don't know that anyone considers you know a Monza like a classic car it's not a disaster like the Vega <laughs> yeah well but I mean if you have a Vega that still runs and they're they're highly desirable right it's pretty now. impressive to me the most the most surprising part of the story though was the good press it got from the start yeah. I mean that this was a car of the year and that everybody talked about how innovative it was and they thought and, you know they were talking about this is how cars going to be built all into the future and uh, the, you know like the Dale you have to who you know did someone not look under the hood yeah. I mean do they really not it's, it's it's interesting. How did you how did you miss? Because I mean, these things started coming apart Quick. when the first yeah right away right. within yeah. it, within a year they were I mean there were ones that were just complete complete disasters and certainly it's amazing they sold two million of the things and uh, they're rare now so many of them mm -hmm. so many of them and I, I I do wonder about that is that they just did they trust GM? GM had a reasonable, had a pretty good reputation at that point. Maybe they did. Yeah, GM had a powerful reputation. I mentioned they had a powerful PR presence yeah. and all sorts of things. But I, you know, I don't know. It, I mean, it it fell apart quickly enough that you would think that that had to have been obvious to some people who had true engineering skill. I mean, mechanics from like two weeks in, mechanics yeah. had to be saying, "Wait, you know, I shouldn't be seeing a two-week-old car." The first people selling the cars are you know touching it up with rust. I and there, there's the famous thing that DeLorean, you know, they they ran it on the track and eight miles in it fell apart yes well the whole front end fell yeah, off yeah. right it's, yeah. he's like it's got to be a record and i'm like how did how are they able to keep that kind of stuff uh secret i, I mean it was clearly a troubled a troubled development and they never yeah. could get the prices down to where they wanted it to it's i mean when they cut out you know that for three dollars a car cutting out the plastic thing I, it's clear that mm -hmm. they were just desperate to cut out anything they could to bring that price any closer and I don't know. It's it's interesting that they couldn't get it there, and I don't know if that was all because of uh, they they talk about that the engineers hated it. Uh, they they didn't want it wasn't their car, and they were just like whatever. We're just going to throw it off. Um, and if that ended up meaning that you know its development was more, they they just weren't working on it the way that maybe it needed. 
It might be. I mean, but they also might never have had the engineering vision. It's also but, fair. But they also, this is this is a corporate headquarters. It's the generals telling the troops how to behave, and and, the, and you know when the troops are like, "Hey, this isn't working," the generals just like, "I gave you an order. You know, get this car out." And so you know that you know that doesn't always uh, lead to success. I mean, it's it is a study uh, in an in institutional you know management. Yeah. It's a study in business management, how to control multiple entities across a corporation. It's it's a study in you know top down management versus bottom up management. And I mean, there's. Uh, I'm sure you could spend quite some time talking about the Vega, just learning about what failed institutionally yeah. at General Motors to have that car come out where, that everybody was so excited about, and have it come out really, you know, to be, you know, junk, to have the front end fall off within, when you drive it just a few miles. So, I mean, that's so. There's and there's much more story there, of course, than it's the history guy. We can only oh, yeah. tell a story for like ten or fifteen minutes. So I think we give, have a great story, a really, you know, great and passionate story there. But if you want to dig in, I'm sure that uh, that could be the subject of research papers for decades to come, just oh, yeah. to talk about the, you know, the, the business management end of that. The engineering management end of it and how so much could go so wrong with something that they were so excited about well, and where and you know how those decisions came to happen because I, I i don't know exactly how they decided that you know the aluminum the aluminum block engines that they were so excited about I, you wonder how exactly they were such complete disasters in that car i i don't know exactly how well i mean all... someone when they got excited about it it's hard to change their mind yeah. i mean that part you know the, it, it starts to get its own kind of weight behind it and then you uh, once it gets its weight behind it then you you know will start to you know see only the data that supports your vision i i do think it's interesting when we're talking about both the dale and the vega whose stories are so different in some ways uh, but they were actually in very similar circumstances part of their part of their hoped success part of the vega's initial success and the, the idea that the dale could be successful uh, was because of this the the yom kippur war and the the vega mm -hmm. actually slightly predates the dale because it came out in 1971 and the dale didn't become a thing until like 1973 um but those it's interesting to me that they were both powered by the the exact same circumstances mm -hmm. i i kind of wanted to talk about i mean how we can see it today how that war really ended up transforming the global auto industry and that it did it in in such an unexpected i mean it was an unexpected place for that to happen you know you expect wars to change things on the ground it's interesting that this war happens and it alters the way the world interacts and the way the world builds cars yeah well not just cars but also our whole energy economy yeah. and everything was everything changed because of it so it is it is interesting because before that cars were bigger they were heavier the larger cars you know uh, looked more luxurious and they were safer and you know, at least we thought that at the time. You know, the more the more metal in your car, the more it's like a battleship. The less likely you were to get injured, and yeah, uh, that might not necessarily have been true. But I mean, it's kind of interesting because no one really talked or thought about miles per gallon, oh. and then when they had to start thinking about miles per gallon, then it you know it did change. So yeah, I, I think, uh, and I'm not a mechanic of any kind, but but uh, cars today are built of almost completely different materials than they were built uh, in the 1970s. And uh, so are people too, as nearly as I can tell. So we're all, we, everything's changed since then. It's not the same. Your your phone doesn't have a cord, and and, and you know I, sometimes I feel like I'm a I'm a late model. But <laughs> <laughs> I've had maybe I've had enough miles now. But uh, I mean there it's it's completely transformed. But I mean then we also have periods in between, like SUVs oh, yeah. weren't a thing at the time, and and now you know sometimes people are looking even for larger cars. I remember uh, so, I remember when I was in high school, Humvees, the Hummers. That it, mm -hmm. how how cool and how big a deal it was to have those big, huge Hummers and how that was that was like kind of this this sign of and then I, Hummer went completely under. I don't I, I think they tried to bring something back. I think we'd have. I'm sure there's experts out here. I think it was sold to a to a another. That's fair. People, someone knows more about that. But I remember when those Hummers were a big deal and then they stopped being. And that's it's interesting to me how that how that kind of that kind of stuff happens, and we do seem to build cars on you know just a completely different even kind of conceptual. It does, and when when prices go yeah. down, the size of cars go up, and then when the gas prices go up, the size of cars go down, and you know now we're talking about cars that won't use gasoline at all. It's interesting, uh, and and uh, so much of it had I mean that was kind of the start of the the Arab oil embargo and and the the increase in prices of gas, but not that, but just straight up gas shortages. Yeah, it wasn't just that gas was expensive; is that gas couldn't be had at any price, and they completely transformed the way that we saw automobiles. No one was really buying automobiles prior to the Yom Kippur War. No one's buying automobiles based on miles yeah. per gallon. And that's what's and, interesting. And no one was, re was really thinking about fuel economy and cars. That's, that's one of the first things you think about. Whenever they're selling a car, yeah, one of the things yeah. they include is it's uh, it's miles per gallon, how, how it's doing on yeah, fuel yeah, economy. Yeah. How, how efficient is this car going to be? And is it going to going to use up all your money? To yeah, they it? talk about the stuff even with, you know, that, you know the gas guzzlers. Uh, with a truck, they'll still tell you what its fuel economy is. And mm -hmm. its fuel economy is still usually better than the stuff that they were. Uh, you, you had mentioned that was 
uh, in the episode, or maybe that was in the Dale episode, that there was like 15 miles a gallon was the the average. It's the average, and, yeah. and these days, oh, we we do better than that. I'm sure that average has come up quite a bit. And even on trucks, they usually get better than that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a total change in uh, yeah. in how we saw things. And so, yeah, I mean, new materials and a new weight and a whole new concepts of how to build cars. That's all came in, and it, that really was the start of it there. Yeah. And and you know, we gas has gone up and down, and so the, the size of cars and etc. have gone up and down. But I don't. I mean, because you know, I old old beaters at first. I mean, we were the sort of family that was getting new cars for the kids. I have to say, uh, and uh, you know, hand me downs from grandparents and stuff like that. And I, yeah, I I'm surprised that they got a mile to gallon. And these things were heavy yeah. back in the days. And it's, I mean, the, the sound a car made when you shut the car door is so radically different <laughs> than the sound that a car makes when it shuts the car door today. As, aside from, you know, the idea that now you don't put your key in the ignition anymore. I mean, almost all new cars are just a button and, and uh, or uh, yeah. I, I, how many of a new generation, if you put them in an old car, would know how to open and close the window. I mean, I understand the mechanics of a crank window. Yeah, I think about that, I mean, that sometimes, that, it's, too. That's all different. The first car I had had the crank windows. And even by then, it was a 1996. So I think that was fairly typical in 1996 was the, the crank windows. But I think of, you know, the people who are just getting cars today uh, – there's a decent possibility that they've never been in a car with, that had yeah. crank windows. With a crank it. window, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, and there's probably never been a car that had built in ashtrays either. Oh. I mean, which you know, yeah, that was that was uh, something mine or, had too. Yeah, that's the which is that's another interesting thing is that that used to be totally common, and now, and I, it's it's interesting how our designs of cars have changed. Not just you know something big like war, but just cultural changes and cultural shifts. And uh -huh. it it is really interesting seeing how that kind of stuff because it kind of happens so slowly as you're watching it that you don't notice until you know suddenly uh sunroofs are standard or moonroofs or what you know that's suddenly yeah. that's something that comes you, on the you car. notice if you're one of those people that uh, buys you know holds a car for 10 years yeah. because then when you go in to get a new car and you're like oh no <laughs> this is how much different it is yeah, i don't i don't i want a car that's something like the one i had and they're like oh those don't we don't make that's, those yeah they don't even make those anymore <laughs> yeah so, yeah it's so uh, it's cool uh, it, and that is part of the story certainly part of the story of the big it's also part of the story of the dale it said that people were looking for something new and you know other people recognized that they would have that demand uh, and then the question is how did you serve that demand? I mean, it's, a, it's an absolutely interesting part of the story because both of those cars, they represent a turning point in history for a nation that is very much involved in the cars that we drive. There's kind of a, a dynamic between where we're trying to make new things and trying to mimic the old. And I think that to some extent, that's kind of, there's always a fight on that. And then when you have something outside like the, the Yom Kippur War that can spur some change. I did, mm -hmm. the, the one of the last things I want to say is that what I will say for the Vega is that it is a pretty good looking car. It's got that kind of Camaro look, especially from the front end. Uh, I think that it, it looks a lot nicer than like the AMC Gremlin uh, or the Pinto. And so I understand, I can understand, I'm, I'm sure there are people who like Gremlins and Pintos. There are probably people out there driving those today. But I do understand the people who like the Vega for its aesthetics because it's. I think it's not actually yeah. a bad looking car. Well, and now it's it's interesting because it's really seen as a sporting yeah. car. But the the Vega, it's it's easy to see what the vision yeah. was. Uh, the the problem was all in execution. It's interesting that even that uh, you know a couple years into the uh, the model years, they had fixed a lot of the issues. For instance, the the overheating of the engine, which was a real problem, they kind of had gotten that fixed. But by the time they had solved some of those some of those problems, no one wanted to buy a Vega anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were selling far fewer cars yeah, yeah. because of the reputation that came. Yeah, that's interesting too. Well, and that they, the part that continued on, they just gave it different yeah. names so that people wouldn't associate it with Vega. Yeah. That's uh, that's an interesting one too, and they still do that today. Although I can't, I don't know if I would could name a car that today has been quite as disastrous as the uh, the Vega. Yeah, honestly, I think there's car people who could. That's probably I mean, one true. of the things about the history guy is that we'll talk. I mean, the next one that we'll be talking about will be talking about you know cats or, or or peanuts or space launches or we whatever. We move on. <laughs> yeah, we, we do. So, and that is part of the fun of the. I think it's part of the reason that people enjoy the channel, and it's part of the reason that we both enjoy doing what we do is because we're not just car people. We're not just boat people. We're not just warp or whatever. We don't. I mean, we we get to go pick and and go along to something else. And so, I'm sure there are people. Because uh, there's a lot of people that are very much into automotive history who can give you all sorts of uh, of different examples. But the Vega was this startling example that is very much memorable and and it, and it makes for a great story. And that's you know that's what we do here at the yeah. History Guy, and so that we can bring it to people who aren't necessarily mechanics, and 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 uh, and it can be interesting to both. And to be honest, those other stories that automotive historians do know, we're always happy to learn about new stories and sometimes tell yeah. them. Yeah, uh, someone's going to suggest it, and it'll be on the History Guy someday.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.